Welcome to the Stories in EDU podcast, the show where we talk with real educators and hear their powerful impact. Their stories will grab you, inspire you, and show you the reach of the work we do. And now, the Bretzman Group presents your hosts, Josh Gauthier and Mandy Taylor. Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Stories in EDU podcast. I'm Jason Bretzman. I am a longtime educator and innovation integrator. I teach AP government and a civics class called American Issues, and you know, in my spare time, I write books, and then I uh, hang out here once in a while when Mandy and Josh uh, let us show up. I am here with uh, Kenny Bosch and our distinguished guest, John Breeze, tonight. Hello, Kenny. Hey, Jason. Uh, thanks for letting me be a part of it again. Uh, my name is Kenny Bosch. I'm a world history teacher, U.S. history, AP U.S. history, American politics teacher in Wisconsin. Uh, this is my 20th year in education and uh, just uh, part of a lot of adventures with Jason. Uh, maybe that'll be the title of another book. Gosh, uh, but not. yeah, maybe not. But, um, you know, just uh, enjoying all the stories that we get to hear and experience when we talk about stories in EDU. Um, with us uh, today, <clears throat> our guest is John Breeze. Uh, John is in his third year as a tech coach at Fort Worth School District, uh, but John has had nine years in education, and he is also a contributing author to the book Stories in EDU. Welcome to the Stories in EDU podcast. Uh, John, we're just excited to have you with us today. Thanks, guys. I'm, I'm really excited to be here. Uh, I, I really just, first off, want to thank you guys for letting me be a part of this. It's really been a fantastic past couple of months uh, with everything getting put together and everyone getting together and connecting um, and lots of in social media and lots of different areas and kind of learning from one another and, and reading these amazing stories from other educators. It's, it's been a lot of fun. It's been a really uh, great process. Well, thank you. Uh, we appreciate that. We couldn't agree more. You know, it is uh, a lot of fun, and this is just another uh, great opportunity for all of us to sit around and, and talk about that process and about the stories that make this book an amazing book to read. And, and I think you're right, and I thank you for everything you said there. And I think you're right that um, these authors who have written the, the stories have really uh, stepped up and connected with each other and, um, you know, have have shared each other's work and have celebrated it. I think that's what this is all about. It's the idea of, of us as educators uh, celebrating and amplifying the good work that everybody's doing out there. So I, I wonder, could you uh, tell the listeners about your story that you wrote in Stories in ADU? So my story uh, goes back to actually before I was a full-time educator, I was, I was actually a substitute. Um, as I was finishing college my last year or so, um, I was substituting three days a week and going to school two days a week just to kind of help out the family and, um, and also kind of get my feet wet and really understand what it's like to be a teacher. And I was in an elementary class which I've spent my entire professional career in high schools. And so elementary is, is really uh, out of my wheelhouse, but it's really where I cut my teeth and, and got to, to know what it was like being around kids all day, every day. And I learned a lot of great classroom management techniques, being with elementary kids to start out. But um, on this particular day, I was substituting a, a second grade class. And the teacher left me the plans to, to go through throughout the day and, and I was, you know, going through them, doing really well. And part of the plan was for students to present their findings, what they had done to the class. And as we were going through, I noticed there was one student that was just very nervous and he had been very quiet all day, hadn't said a word. Um, and when it came for his turn, he kind of broke down. And, and just started crying. And I was a substitute. I was still working through my education classes, you know, um, in my mind, I'm, I'm and that's running not part through of any class. Yeah, like no. they, they haven't covered this yet. I don't know what to do. <laughs> and so I, I, uh, I, I freaked out for about 30 seconds and then kind of got my wits about me. And I went and I talked to him and I, I 
pulled him out in the hallway so that I could talk to him. And immediately my first worry was, oh my gosh, I'm making it worse by pulling him out in the hallway. But it, it, it actually allowed me to kind of work with him and connect with him and talk to him. And what we did was we kind of took it slow as he was kind of inconsolable and he didn't know me. So I couldn't exactly build a relationship with him in the three seconds while he's crying in the hallway. And so um, I was just trying to work with him and I said, okay, who is your, who is your closest friend in the class? And he told me. And so I went and got that student and, and I'm helping, um, you know, direct students and they're working with some self-directed stuff while I'm, while I'm doing this, I'm kind of one eye on, you know, in the classroom and one eye in the hallway having these conversations. And I had that other student come out. And I said, okay, you made your presentation, you did everything. Now present what you did in class to this person, which was their friend. And he did amazing, absolutely amazing. Um, he did a full presentation, very detailed, super, super sharp kid. And I said, you know, that, that wasn't so hard. And uh, cause it was a short presentation. It was maybe two minutes. Sure. And then I grabbed another student that I had seen the two of them kind of conversating conversating with earlier in the day and I, I pulled that other student out there and I said, okay, time to, let's do it again. Let's, let's run another practice run. And, um, and so they did that and he did it again and everything was great and he was calmed down and he was smiling and he was happy. And so we went back in the classroom and instead of doing full group presentations, I kind of trying to act um, on my feet as quick as I could. I said, let's break up into some small groups and let's work to where we can present and talk to a small group of people rather than the entire class. Maybe it's a little less intimidating. Yep. And I put him in the group with the two kids he'd already presented to and like one other student. And we did that and I got back in the swing of things and was going through the class and working with the kids. And then just naturally I said, okay, you presented to this group, let's rotate. And we rotated where, you know, some kids went this way and some kids went this way and they started presenting and I got this cold chill over me like, oh my gosh, I just put this kid in another, another position to fail. And Here comes the crying again. Yeah, right. I was so scared. <laughs> like, how could I forget in the matter of four minutes what I had just gone through? And, um, and, and he did amazing. He presented to this class, to, to his small group, and we kept rotating and every group that he was in, he presented and did an amazing, amazing job. And then after that, we did some, some other activities throughout the day and I noticed him smiling and laughing and, and talking to the class and he even raised his hand and answered a question later in the day. And so it really helped me as I was really getting started to be an educator on you know, learning how to not only building relationships with kids and getting to know kids. Had I known this student better, I, I would have been better prepared for this situation and we could have, you know, uh, missed the, the crying part and made him more comfortable. But at the same time, it really made me excited and it really made me realize how much I was going to love this job because I had helped this student overcome this fear. And I felt um, selfishly, I felt a little proud of myself, but as well, I was so proud of the student for being able to overcome this and be able to work through it that uh, I knew that this was the job for me. You know, um, yeah. I, I'm in it. This is what I'm, I'm supposed to be doing. That's well, uh Go ahead, Jason. I was just going to say, I think where you brought that kid, uh, you know, from crying in the hallway to volunteering and leading, you know, his own uh, presentation. And, and that's a pretty, um, you know, stark contrast in just a, a few minutes. And yeah, I could see where you would say, hey, I did a good job here. <laughs> and, and you did. Yeah, and you did. You must have uh, some some pretty good credentials there as a substitute. You know, a lot of times, unfortunately, you know, I think uh, people think let's just make this as easy on the substitute as possible, and they gave you kids presenting in class. <laughs> Second you know, that, graders, that's, that's, hey, go get it. Uh, that's pretty tough. That's a tall order. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll I'll be honest. There were some substitute lessons where I would go to high school science classes and watch March of the Penguins seven times <laughs> throughout the day. And then, you know, in, in the secondary classes, they were real. All right. We did something real simple, but the elementary classes, they didn't skip a beat. They were doing what they were normally yep. doing. And, yep. 
you know, you just throw you into the fire, I guess. Yeah. Right away. It, it was, uh, yeah. It, it was scary, but it was good for me. <laughs> you know, it, the part you brought up, I think is one of those things that, um, as an educator, you have to, it's your professional judgment where you sit there and you say, the plans say this, um, but it doesn't go perfectly. And now I need to make an adjustment and you just, you trusted your instincts right there. Um, what a great move to ask him about a friend and bring him into an area where he could be comfortable and he got to practice it and then do it again with another friend. And then, and, and then that's just a smart move by you to bring two kids into that small group with him where he could have comfort again. And I bet his confidence just rose. Uh, did you happen to have any opportunities to be back in that school and see that, that kid again or anything like that? No, unfortunately, I, I do know some of the teachers in that school um, and they would, I, I asked about him all the time. Yeah. Um, but after he went on and to a different school, I, I don't know where he went. I've, in, in yeah. fact, I know his first name, but I don't know his last name. And so I've thought about looking him up in the system, sure. <laughs> but sure. um, just to see where he's at. Cause I go to lots of different schools, but I haven't had the opportunity to follow up with him. I'm, I'm kind of disappointed about that. Yeah, maybe someday. Maybe he'll come back someday and uh, introduce himself. We call That's him right. Steve in the book, right? Uh, That's you right, don't have yes. To share his, his real name. Um, yeah, Kenny, uh, you saying that stuff just reminded me, um, you know, we'll, we'll probably have to cut this part out uh, uh, when we edit it, <laughs> but uh, making adjustments. I, I was a substitute uh, for two years, and I remember going into a high school um, – shop class they called it at the time it was like in the mid 90s and it was it was a metals class and uh, the kids came in and I was like hey it's gonna be a great day today and all that kind of stuff and they're like oh yeah just as long as we don't have to watch that stupid movie about the boat again and I'm like oh you mean the boat video that they left for <laughs> us here well you know ships are made out of metal we have to watch something about metal we've seen that movie three times already so uh yeah what it, it, the uh dukes of hazard tv show had just kept come out on the uh nashville network or something like that whatever it was called at the time and somebody said uh, well I've, I've got it in my locker and we watched <laughs> that and i'm like well I don't know. We'll have to, we'll have to see. And so the kid went through his locker, got it. I'm like, well, you know, the general Lee also made out of metal. <laughs> there is an application. <laughs> they, they were the happiest they've ever been in that class. I'm, poor I'm kids. sure. Um, yeah. The poor kids. They, if I would have had them take notes, I think they would have. But um, the other thing it made me think of is I um, don't tell my wife about this, but um, one black Friday uh, I got these two, there may be, I don't know, 19 inch TVs and I've got them on a cart. And so in my AP class, I teach high school. Um, they do presentations, but they do small presentations, right? So they're not presenting the, their content to the whole class. So, you know, it's, it's kind of like what you did, John. It's like, I don't really need you to be an expert at presenting right now, but you got that kid there. What I need is to know, do you, you know, know the content. Can you do your two minute presentation or whatever it is? And so I got these small TVs, they hook their Chromebooks into them. They gather around a, a group of five, five is the minimum. And then everybody gives them a score and I tell them they get to pick uh, whichever five scores they want. So there's a little bit of an incentive, you know, cause if you know, you got five scores and somebody gives you a bad score, then you got to take that. But if you get seven kids and two of them give you a bad score, you, you still got the five to choose from, and you know, some of them are willing to go even bigger than that. So, you know, yeah. the, the idea that we can adjust things to make, make it do what we want it to do. We don't want the kid to cry. We want the kid <laughs> to tell us what he knows. Right. So how can we adjust? Well, and we also want them to learn uh, lots of different skills uh, and that they're going to be able to use moving forward. I mean, I did something similar in my graphic design classes. I would have students and I would tell them, okay, you know, you, you would have to make pitches to people. Sometimes you may be presenting to an entire room of people. Sometimes you may be presenting to one person that will hold your future in your hands, you know, kind of like a job interview. And so we would do lots of presentations in class, but sometimes it was to everyone. Sometimes uh, I wish I had the TVs. That's really cool. And I love the, the grading idea of everybody giving a grade. That's really neat. But I would just have, because um, I had a, a computer lab in my class, 
I would have, you know, five presentations going on at the same time in the, in the class and everybody like four kids would huddle around one student's computer. And so mm -hmm. um, sometimes they would do that. And sometimes they would just do like a screencast that would be just a different form of presentation. So, cause I tell them sure. you're going to have to present in so many different ways. I mean, look at yeah. what we're doing now is completely right. different than what a lot of things. Um, you got to, you got to uh, um, check out the, the elevator and uh, have them do an elevator pitch. Sure. <laughs> you, yeah. We're starting at the ground floor. You got to tell me what you know by the time we get to the third floor. And I've done the same thing. You know, and Jason has heard this kind of stuff from me before. He, you know, Jason and I, uh, we have classrooms right across from each other. And um, when I, back when we wrote our book, uh, Flipping 2.0, and I was flipping my classes before the book came out. But in there, I was talking about, that process. And, and I thought was, was the goal to have kids be really nervous and present in front of 30 people, or was the goal to have them be excited about what they're talking about and get to work with a group of people. And then, you know, there's just a number of ways we can do that. You know, there's times I know in Jason's room, there's times he'll hand out a deck of cards. Uh, he'll pass out a card and they get in like groups based on that. Um, in my classroom, the kids get to pick whatever they want within a topic, which is really almost unlimited topics. So I could have, right now I have 143 kids. I could have 143 different projects on completely different topics. Um, I've had it other ways like, um, you know, John Wright sit there and have the kids in like groups so that they could be um, a focused group on a topic or in other times I'll have them be the, uh, the lead on a topic and put them in dissimilar groups and they sit around and just talk. And I don't know, I, I think there's a lot of value in having kids sit in those groups and um, just kind of share their passion. And it's pretty cool. Like you said, if they feel that uh, they know what they're talking about, they'll probably be pretty excited to keep talking about it. it John, in, in your role as um, a tech, is it a tech coach? Is that what you call it there? Yeah, uh, I'm, our, our high schools are one to one and we actually just our middle schools are starting to get Chromebooks. And so I help teachers find ways to integrate technology in in your role as a tech coach. Have you seen or if you had the opportunity uh, to help somebody do what you did with our, our Steve guy where you've helped them, you know, adjust some things or, or make it so that, um, you know, it's better for everybody? Yeah, actually, I mean, you guys know all of the amazing tech tools that are out there um, can find new ways to allow students to express themselves. And I have teachers that say, hey, we used, you know, Screencast-O-Matic or some sort of screencasting tool. And I got work out of a student that I never would have imagined I, I, I got. The kid had his laptop at home working on it, creating this uh, presentation and whatever they were doing. And, and he created this screencast that was by far the best one of anything in class. But when he's in class, he can't pay attention. He's always trying to leave. He's skipping class. He's doing this. But when you put this in his hand, he performed amazingly. Mm -hmm. And it really changed the relationship between the teacher and the student because, you know, that teacher saw, oh my gosh, look at the potential that this student has based on this work. And that teacher realized that whatever they were doing before was not reaching that student. And so they just needed to kind of change it up. And so apps like Screencast and or Screencast-O-Matic, Flipgrid, those type of things that really, I mean, they advertise taking the kid from the back row and making and not making them participate, but finding a way for them to participate in class has been fantastic. And so all I have to do is teach one teacher and they have that amazing experience. And then I have 14 teachers in my office saying, I want to learn this. And it, it spreads like wildfire. It's, it's really, really fantastic. Excellent. And I'll admit I got involved in the Flipgrid fever back uh, last spring and all that. Um, and I had some students that, you know, were sort of doing it on their own after they were introduced to it in class. Um, initially they're like wait a minute i got i think it was they had to either it was oh, i think it was two different things you had to say what you were reading and um in the news and then there was another thing where you had to explain the uh difference between a or explain what divided government was and whether or not we had it and you know when i first introduced it they were like 
wait, I got to say something on a video. Wait, that's weird. What can I just write it down? Can't, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and so I had to introduce it by making the video while I was introducing it. So it was, I literally walked over to the computer while I was telling them what it was and how to use it and clicked record. And I told them, you know, we're making a video right now. And, you know, and I probably made some funny faces and said some silly things. And that, But then that wasn't the end of it, right? I had to stop the recording and then I had to play it because right. the whole thing is they're already thinking, even though I do this a thousand times a day and show everybody my tongue and make my, you know, cute lip face, whatever, what do they call it? Duck face. Duck you know? face. <laughs> um, they're like, wait a minute, I'm going to record a video and then other people are going to see it. So, so yeah, I, I stopped it and then press play and you know, they're head in hands and shaking their head at me and you know, they know I'm a little bit nuts and that's okay. Um, but it, it, you know, breaks the ice and then they were like, Hey, I guess I can do this. And I did have them, you know, go out in the hallway to make the videos. And um, again, we got to not tell my wife this stuff, but when she throws away the, um, or tries to throw away the stuffed animals, they end up in my classroom. <laughs> so I tell them, if you don't want to be in the video, you just take one of those stuffed animals and put it in front of the camera and it'll be okay. You got a talking tiger, it just has your voice in it. <laughs> but I get to learn what they know, right? I get to hear their definitions and, and it breaks the ice. So. You yeah, know, I, I actually have uh, teachers who, because at first some of the kids are very nervous to be in front of the camera. And um, I had a math teacher that used it not for making a video face to face. He had the students roll their, their device over and I showed him how to make it where he would give them an algebra problem and they had to solve it by writing it out by hand, but awesome. record it with their webcam and put it on Flipgrid. And mm -hmm. so that way the students could see their peers process of working through the, the process. And um, a lot of the kids would do it and then turn it up and want to see their face. And they still, they'd still want, are driven to that camera. They, once they get started on it, they love it. But at first they're a little apprehensive, but it, it goes quick. I agree. You know, that's uh, an interesting point too. You know, um, as I've talked about earlier, I, I try to give my students a lot of choice and sometimes though they need a nudge and in, and teachers as well, you know, some teachers will say they don't want to be in videos and I say, well, you don't have to be, uh, but you could be. And, you know, we could use a different background, but for my students, I started a few years ago making all of them make one video. And um, we have a, in my classroom, I have a 16 foot by 20 foot green screen and the kids get to use that and they just have to make one video in the first four or five projects and after that more and more of them want to do it and they're kind of excited about it and i always say it's you know sometimes kids need someone to blame you know they they want to be able to say my teacher makes me do these he makes me do them <laughs> and that makes them feel better even because they'll come up and say i really do like making videos but the other kids say they don't like making videos so i just blame it on you every week and i go that's fine you know, uh, I, I want you to enjoy what you're doing. So sometimes we have to give them that nudge, you know, and I don't know if you're seeing in your role any, you know, other places you've had a nudge, either students or teachers to try and take some of that risk and try to kind of go forward with this stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, <clears throat> I've had teachers that struggle with, uh, or, or not necessarily teachers. I have students that struggle with some of the things that I try to teach them you know, hey guys, we need to save everything to Google Drive or we need to use OneDrive or some sort of, of cloud account. And all, a lot of times it'll take one student that'll lose something very, very important. And they will then turn and tell their story because they had something saved to the desktop of their device and then their hard drive crashed and they lost everything. Right. And, um, and they come to me and the first thing I say is, well, did you save it to Google Drive or something like that? And they then start crying and I, it's kind of a theme of some of my stories <laughs> crying <laughs> around me but so you um, make kids cry a lot i know a, right that's, yeah, that's, that's your all thing. that on your business card yeah yeah right. uh, hopefully my future employers aren't aren't gonna see that <laughs> hold that against me I specialize in children crying yeah. right. it's a learning experience a learning but, experience. Um, but we but fix it every time it just takes one student telling that story right. of this happened to me and 
all the kids are, are, are learning and the teachers are learning and they're saying, okay, how do I avoid this happening to me? And so I hate that it has to happen to one person, but um, you know, sometimes that just has to, has to go. And then all of a sudden the kids all grow from it, kids and, and teachers. Mm -hmm. That's the nudge that they need. Well, John, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure talking with you. We got, uh, well, two more things we got to take care of yet before you go. Uh, in just a moment, we're going to talk about uh, one of the cards from the game of stories, but um, I also want to make sure that everybody listening can get in contact with you. Uh, if uh, they want to get some more uh, expertise or if they got some kids that need some crying that they can <laughs> <laughs> go to a guy who can help them through it. Uh, I'm your how man. Do, how, do, <laughs> how do they contact you uh, on Twitter or social media or however else? Um, find me on Twitter at John Breeze, J O H N B R I E S E. Um, that's, that's the best way I've, uh, I've got my phone on me all the time. I'm on Twitter more than I'd like to admit. <laughs> All right, that's good. Well, as I mentioned, we've got the um, the game of stories here. It's 52 different prompts about a whole host of different uh, topics in education, stuff that we all care about. Um, it's a deck of cards that you can get uh, on Amazon if you don't have one already. And we're going to shuffle up and deal here and pick one of those as a as a last uh, chance to tell a story. This is not a sound effect. This is real. I'm shuffling right now, and we're going to pick one of these cards. This is a new deck. Holy cow. It's crisp. It, is, it is crisp. I'm going to pick one <laughs> right in the middle here. Maybe it's not the middle. There it is. How about number number four? Oh, okay. Uh, four Diamonds says, encourage front-end student choice. Tell a story about how you encouraged students to choose a path for their learning that allowed all students or groups of students to go in their own direction. What did you learn from the process? How did you act as their GPS on their journey? So we're talking about front end student choice. How did you encourage students to choose a path for their learning that allowed them to go in their own direction? Um, so I'll, I'll start if you guys yep, do it. Sounds great. If you guys want. Um, so I taught English four for a couple of years and I would all, we would, it's British literature was the curriculum. We would go through and work through British lit. And one year I had a group of students and a lot of those students had never read a full book um, on their own. They, and they struggled with some of the British lit and understanding it. And I, I'm an English major, so I'm passionate about all of that stuff. And I, and they would kind of feed off of that and they would do well. But towards the end of the year, I decided, okay, guys, my goal is I just want you to read and I want to spread my love of reading with you. And so I said, um, you know, you can just choose a book, any book. And they were surprised that there were books out there for, and a lot of it came from pop culture from movies and other things. And they said, Oh, there's a book for this. And there's a book for this. And, and a lot of them read the hunger games and, and things like that. And they would get it, get started. And um, I wound up actually reading a lot of these books with them so that I could kind of know what they're talking about. And, and I had students who had never read a book their entire life. Wow. Finished the hunger games in two days and come back oh, and no. say, does the library have the second one and the third one? <laughs> um, but it's because I gave them this option. You know, we had yep. done, we had read books in class. We had read um, different things in class and they just weren't into it. And I realized right then, and this was only my third year in the classroom. So I was still kind of developing and, and learning. And I realized, you know, giving the students these, this choice saying, I don't care what it is, as long as it is appropriate and it, it's, it's positive, um, find a book and, and read it. And my students learned more in that one um, assignment that we did that we actually kind of dragged it on. We started that in April and we just kept doing that type of thing where kids would just choose different books for the rest of the year because they loved it so much and they were reading. And there were some classes where they would 
come to class and say, um, you know, can we, can we just read? I just want to read my book. My, I got in trouble last period because I was reading my book in class. And, um, and I even had other teachers come up to me and say, so-and-so was reading in my class. How did you do that? Wow. <laughs> and, and so, you know, stuff like that is, I realize that when you allow students to choose their own path, they're going to learn more than when we really try to steer them down particular ways. And obviously we have to steer them in certain ways um, for lots of different reasons. But when we give them this choice, whether it's what book to read or what tool to use or, or how to show their learning, whether they're creating graphics or videos or websites or, or writing an essay or something along those lines, um, they really, really take to it and they learn from it. And it's, it's really a fantastic way to go about doing things. Excellent. I can tell you that uh, I feel like a lot of the, the student choice that I'm engaged with is at the end, right? So it's the showing the learning. Um, so when I think of student choice, I'm thinking of all the different ways they've shown their learning. Um, so I, I really had to think about this one a little bit. I, I love your exam and it's all about the reading, right? Um, unless you have a content specific, I have to read this book. I, you know, the, the way you do it is good. Um, my students are, are reading and they're writing and all that kind of stuff, but we added another um, facet to their learning in the civics class that I teach, uh, which is podcasts. So my experience has been over the last dozen years or so that students are getting a lot of the news from our class, they sort of know some of the things that's going on, this, that are going on, but they always have the question, why do we need to know this? Why is this important? Why do people care about this? Why is this important in the bigger scheme of things? And so we started listening to podcasts uh, where there's more analysis. So they're getting the news, they can read it, they can watch a little bit of it, they can hear about it, but when they get the podcast, they're getting you know, experts in the field, analyzing it, explaining to them, and maybe even predicting what's gonna happen next. And so they get that. And what they, I think, most like in the beginning, um, and we've only been doing it for a couple of weeks, is that they're choosing, right? I'm not saying, go and listen to these minutes of this one podcast. Um, we have a, a menu of six recommended podcasts, but then I tell them if you like something else, yeah. go ahead and find that. Um, and then of all of the hundreds of episodes that they have, I tell them to find one that's recent that they can agree on with their partner. And then I tell them you can define what recent is, you know, if it, is it last month, you know, in the last month or is it in the last week or is something really important happening that it has to be today's podcast, you decide and then, you know, you listen to it together. And I, I think they really like that because they get to sort of look at the headlines and see, you know, is this something I want to listen to? And, uh, and I had one girl last week, she or whenever it was now, um, she was listening to an analysis of Serena Williams, um, you know, breaking her racket and all that kind of stuff and uh, sexism and all of that, as opposed to, you know, male counterparts on the, tennis tour um and while she's doing that she's on youtube looking up the actual event so that she can see it for herself so she's watching what happened she's listening to these experts in washington dc analyze it and i'm like yeah this is good worlds are colliding and this is good right yeah i mean for both of you and your stories you know and all of us it's not just saying you know student voice and student choice but giving them just the option all the time almost everywhere you know, we hear all kinds of things, but for some of us, it's not about like flexible seating choice. That That is one way students can have choice. Um, you know, Jason's students think that he hates posters and uh, my students think that, you know, we hate Google Docs. And I always tell them like changing the font or using Google Slides and changing the background is not really student choice. And, you know, we just want them to go out there and experience, um, you know, all kinds of options and, and have a little less fear. You know, so like what you were saying uh, earlier, John, about the book, you know, that much freedom is sometimes almost debilitating or like kids just don't know what to do. They like sit there like, what do you mean I can do whatever I want? And, you know, they're not used to that amount of freedom. And after they get some of that freedom, uh, that's kind of my story is that after they get some of that freedom, when they go to other classrooms, they sometimes have a hard time 
uh, you know, my students will say, you let us use, I, I think I currently have something around the lines of 130, 140 tech tools that my students can choose from. And they just, they do. In the beginning, they're still using Google Slides and Prezi. And by the end, you know, we, we keep this uh, uh, project log where they keep track of everything. And by the end, they'll look back and they'll go, man, I can't believe I used Google Slides like that. You know, and then we just laugh about it. Uh, and they'll say, yeah, now I, I can do all these great things. And I think that's part of the student choice too, is about, you know, can we give them transferable skills? You know, can we give them an experience? And I just feel like, you know, the more unique experiences you give kids, the more they're going to enjoy uh, your class and, and school as a whole. So, I mean, that, that's really my story. I mean, I have other examples too, but I think that's just how I front, front end load everything is just to just give my kids as much choice as I possibly can everywhere. Very good. Well, John, uh, thank you again for being here. Uh, we really appreciate your stories and all the great work that you're doing. Um, it's so great to hear more from you, and I'm sure we'll continue to hear more from you in the future. Absolutely. I, I just thank you guys for having me on here. This is It's been an amazing experience all around. I've, I've really had a lot of fun with it. We're glad to hear that. We appreciate you being here. Jason, are you going to remind the audience where they can pick up our Stories in EDU book? Well, I sure am, Kenny. You can get uh, that book, um, Stories in EDU, Sail with a Fleet, uh, on Amazon at bit.ly slash, that's B-I-T dot L-Y slash, Stories in EDU 1. That might imply that there's a second book coming in our future. Yeah. Uh, it's been a great conversation here, great stories uh, with John Breeze, and it's so fantastic to have so many people as part of our fleet. Great educators, great stories. Let's keep sharing them with the world because we sail with a fleet. We might feel like we're alone sometimes in our classrooms, but we sure are in this together. Thanks so much for joining us, and we look forward to the next time that we can talk and share some stories from our classrooms to yours. Thank you for tuning in to the Stories in EDU podcast. Please be sure to subscribe and leave us a review. Until next time, thanks again.